I come from a very tiny country. You've probably never heard of it. It's called Northern Ireland. <laughs> and it has a tragic history in terms of the impression it gives to the world of Christianity. But my parents were very unusual. They were Christian without being sectarian. That expressed itself in the fact that my father attempted so far as he could to employ in his business equally across the religious divide. That meant we got bombed and my brother nearly got killed. But it stuck with me that one of the basic principles that he embodied was he strongly believed that every man and woman has got infinite value as a creature of God. All of us, male and female, made in God's image. You know, the sun and the stars and the galaxies show the glory of God. They were not made in His image. You were. And that gives you an infinite worth. And my parents believed that and they practiced it. The second thing, that I owe to them was that they allowed me to think. And they introduced me, even as a teenager, to alternative cultures. When I was about 13, my father gave me a copy of the Communist Manifesto. I said, what's that for? He said, I think you should read it. I said, Dad, why? He said, you need to know what other people think. I ended up going to Cambridge to study mathematics, and in my first couple of weeks there, I was challenged at dinner by one of my fellow students. He said to me, quite bluntly, he said, do you go to church? Do you believe in God? And then he said, oh, I'm so sorry. You're Irish. I should never have asked that question. <laughs> All you Irish believe in God, and you fight about it. And you know I'd heard that many times before, but Suddenly it occurred to me, this needs further investigation. My parents Christian, my grandparents Christian, their parents Christian, fourth or fifth generation. Of course I'm Christian, it's just Irish genetics and DNA, that's it. <laughs> so I decided that day that I would get to know and befriend someone who didn't share my worldview. I've spent my entire life doing that. My interest in people that don't come from my background led me during the Cold War to Eastern Europe, and I speak German so I could move in and out particularly of East Germany. And then when the wall fell and I helped to knock it down, I started going to Russia because I could lecture in Russian. And so I interacted with people in the Academy of Sciences, constantly discussing with them why they believed what they did. So my life has been led to focus on the diametrical opposite of Christianity, and that is atheism. Little did I know that one day I would have the opportunity to debate some of the leading atheists in the world. And Russia and Eastern Europe was a very good preparation for it. And the question arises, how do you maintain stability in that kind of context? And what I wish to share with you briefly is a story of a person who managed to do this in a very remarkable way. You all know who it is, and we're talking 26 centuries ago. He's almost unique in history. In fact, he is unique in history because he's the only person I know of who ran two empires, the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian that followed it. And he was a believer in God. And he writes a book in high old age to tell us what were those central things that enabled him to preserve something that was remarkable. Now, as you see, I'm old. That's one of the reasons I'm sitting. <laughs> but as you get older, you begin to distill what is important from what is not important. And you notice certain things. 
I speak of my own culture. I know many people. They go to church. They read their Bible. They say their prayers. But long ago, they stopped witnessing in public. They lost the cutting edge of their witness. And that's a tragedy because the secular pressure of our society is do God if you want, but do it in a church. Don't do God in public. I disagree. I think we are commanded to do God in public. We have no option. But the difficulty is, <laughs> the difficulty is it's a scary thing to do. The biggest problem most of us face, if we're honest, is the first step of engagement outside the ghetto of our own small circle. How do we break that barrier? So let me share just a few things that figured in Daniel's life and have figured greatly in mine. In fact, they impelled me to write a book on Daniel. And if you want more of this stuff, you know where to get it. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. The book starts with a historical note that is quite remarkable. It says that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar was the emperor of a vast empire. He comes to this little tiny city in a very, very small nation of Judah, and he besieged it. And Daniel says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim as king into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And you stop and you think, this is not a simple historical reference. It's an interpretation of history. The Lord gave Jehoiakim into his hand. And you say, but that's absurd. I mean, if it had been the other way around, and the Lord had given Nebuchadnezzar, the vast emperor with all the missiles and rockets and all the rest of it, if he'd given him into the hand of the tiny king, well, we might have thought God was behind it. But how ridiculous any contemporary historian would say that the Lord gave the tiny king and his tiny country into the hand of the emperor. Why would you want to think that God was behind it? And so it raises question number one. Is there a God behind history? And the question that's related to it is this. Is there a God behind your history? Because you see, Daniel was captured and taken with his friends and removed geographically hundreds of miles from his monotheistic culture into a polytheistic culture. And it happened virtually overnight. He had to learn a new language. He had to learn new laws. He got involved in a totally different educational system, administrative system. So he was moved geographically from one culture to another. Now what has happened in the UK, I don't know whether it's happened here or not, but what has happened in the UK is we've stayed there and the culture has changed around us. And in many cultures in the world, 
That is precisely what is happening. People are staying geographically, but the influences and the culture is subtly changing all around them. And so Daniel is catapulted into this very new culture, and the text says that God was behind it. You know, it's very easy to say that God is behind life when it's going well. But what when you're ripped from home as a teenager, he was probably about 15, and taken away possibly never to see your parents again, just with three other friends? How could you believe God is behind that? And what this introduces us to is this. There are global dimensions in what happens to the world where we get caught up in our little histories. And sometimes the global dimensions are caused for reasons that are way outside our control. Daniel is a brilliant teacher, and he later explains in his book why it happened. And it happened because Judah had resisted the preaching of the prophets that constantly told the nation and had done to Israel before them, look, if you compromise with idolatry, with the ideology of the Babylonians, you will end up there. The punishment will fit the crime, but they didn't listen. And so globally, there was an earthquake and Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. And Daniel was caught up in it in his own personal history. Now, many of you sitting here, your personal history may be very complex. And you may be sitting in a place at this moment, I don't know, but I'm going to speak openly to you, where you're asking a lot of big questions. Why is this happening to me here and now? And it's very difficult for you to see it in any sort of big picture. But Daniel didn't lose his faith over this. Why not? Because when it happened, he saw it was a fulfillment of God's Word. That's what he explains in chapter 9. What happened, even though to him it was painful, it fulfilled God's Word, and therefore he didn't lose his confidence in Scripture. That is a hugely important thing for me to hear. Because there are attacks from every direction on our confidence in Scripture. Remember, the first attack on humanity was the evil one insinuating the idea through a question, has God really said? And that's where you're going to be attacked, and it's where I'm going to be attacked, and it's why. Let me speak to the young people. If you're going to affect your nation and the world, you're going to have to get into the Word of God in a way in which my generation in the United Kingdom did not do. They tried to entertain Christians, and they entertained them to death because they didn't give them any authoritative teaching of Scripture. They would nothing to cling on to, and so they were left utterly empty. Young people, I plead with you, get into the Word of God. You say, I have no time. Well, just think about this. Ask yourself, for the past week, how much time you spent watching a screen looking at stuff that's absolutely nothing to do with your work or with your Christian faith, and then tell me you've got no time. We need to learn to do a little bit of electronic fasting. In my young day, it was only the birds that tweeted. Now, sometimes I fear it's the bird brains, but never mind. <laughs> That's unfair. I'm all for the good use of social media and so on. But you get what I mean. We need to make sacrifices, and sacrifices are not giving up something that's bad. That's not a sacrifice. That's what we've got to do as believers. Sacrifice is giving up good things to go for better things. And if we need anything in the world, everywhere I go, people say, where are the people who are able to teach Scripture? 
So Daniel was confident in Scripture, and therefore he was able to take what happened. But then something else happened. And it's a very odd thing to say. It's in the second statement. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. But it doesn't stop there. It's a very odd sentence. He gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasure of his God. What's that got to do with anything? This is a very compressed book. What is the point of mentioning the fact that of all the things Nebuchadnezzar did was he took some vessels out of the temple of God in Jerusalem and took them home? We haven't even got to Daniel yet. Surely he and his friends are more important than these vessels. Well, of course they are in a sense, but you know if you're a scientist, anomalies intrigue you. This is one of those anomalies that gets you interested. Why mention these things at all? Well, think about it with me. Let's ask a few questions of the text. The golden and silver vessels from the temple, they were put in his temple in Babylon in the treasure house of his God. Now, Babylon had over a thousand temples at this time. And it had many museums attached to them. It was very high culture indeed. It was light years ahead of Judah, of course. These men had landed in an amazing high culture. And if you doubt that, go to the British Museum and you see the relics of it. It was spectacular, the culture. I mean, look at us all. On our wrists, most of us have a bit of Babylon, though we don't realize it. You may have noticed that there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. That comes from Babylonia because their mathematics was done to base 60. They were brilliant engineers. They were brilliant artists. They were brilliant musicians. They were superb architects. They were culturally very, very much at the top in the world. Some of their buildings were among the wonders of the ancient world. Daniel's coming from a very simple monotheistic culture into a swinging city at the heart of high culture. Well, what could be wrong with that? Well, we're going to think about that in a minute. But let's see what Nebuchadnezzar did. He took these golden vessels, silver vessels, and he put them in the museum. Now, museums around the world are full of stolen, I mean, full of all kinds of... Uh, <laughs> artifacts that they get from various places <laughs> by sometimes dubious means. He didn't destroy them. He didn't melt them down. He ascribed to them a certain value. Now, here's the question. This is introducing to us the second major thing. The first one is Daniel's sense of the sovereignty of God in history, that God was guiding. And there is, of course, a Christian equivalent of it. It runs right through the Bible. There's nothing can stabilize you more than knowing that God is a hand over your life. And even beyond that, that God has given you not simply guidance, but a guide. He's given you a shepherd. I am the good shepherd. But now the next thing is values. In the temple of God in Jerusalem, those golden vessels symbolized God as absolute value. What Nebuchadnezzar did was put them in a section probably marked Judah. And he was a fairly naive kind of ancient emperor. You can imagine the inscription, I, Nebuchadnezzar, on the such and such, I conquer this tiny nation. Aren't I a very clever emperor? Because look at their lovely artifacts. I must be a genius to overcome people like that. It was that kind of naive arrogance. But he had many other sections in the museum. So what was he doing? He was taking what Daniel and his friends regarded as absolute, and he was relativizing it do you recognize that? That's what's happening in my culture. Absence of absolute values. 
There's no absolute truth, which is a very odd thing, isn't it? For people to say the statement, there is no absolute truth, is held as an absolute truth by those who say it. There's not much logic these days around the place, but sadly, that has caught on. And a friend of mine has said, people are usually only relativist and postmodern in areas that they count as unimportant. You'll never find a postmodern bank manager. You go into the bank and say, I want 200,000 rand, and he looks up on the computer and he says, you're 500,000 rand in the red. Oh, that's only your truth. <laughs> Try it. That is a trend in Daniel's society. To relativize the concept of God. To pluralize it in their ideology. Well, you like Jesus, wonderful. I like crystals myself. And some people prefer Mother Earth. And it's all just a relative pick and mix society. Do you know, I can imagine, but then I'm Irish. We are full of imagination, we Irish. <laughs> Daniel and his friends from time to time going down to the museum and looking at those beautiful things and him saying to his friends, guys, that's what we stand for. The Christian equivalent of it is this, our Father, hallowed be your name. In other words, setting God as our supreme value. Now we need to ask ourselves, what are our values? They are expressed in the way in which we behave. And if we're going to stand and witness to the world, there's a very famous text in 1 Peter 3, and you all know it, always be ready to give a defense that those that ask you a reason for the hope that is within you. But the condition is very rarely mentioned, and it's this. Sanctify in your heart Jesus as Lord, and always be ready. Peter's context is fear, which is wonderful because he was a man who got afraid, and we know that. The whole world knows that, but Peter funked it on occasion, and we all get afraid. I don't care who you are. We all have a level of fear under peer pressure so that it keeps us quiet when we get opportunity. Well, let me encourage you. How do we overcome the fear? Two things. One, to sanctify in our hearts Jesus as Lord, and that's a present continuous. We do it constantly. That is, we have a vertical reference for our values. And then we are ready to give an answer to people that ask, do you please notice that that's not preaching? By definition, it isn't. It's one-on-one. -on -one. People who ask you for a reason. I used to be bothered by that as a student because I thought I was ready to give an answer, but nobody ever asked. <laughs> oh, you may laugh, but when was the last time anybody asked you directly for a reason. When was it? You might have my problem. And I remember sharing it with a younger Christian, and he laughed, and he said, why don't you ask them? I said, concerning the hope that's in them? He said, yes. Well, I said, they don't have any hope. So what's the point in asking him? He said, he said try it next time. So here I was going to London on the train, and I noticed the man next to me reading a scientific paper. So I said, are you a scientist? And he said, yes. He said, what are you? I said, I'm a mathematics student. So I took out New Testament and started reading it. <laughs> and I held it so as he could see it, of course. And um, eventually he said, um, you said you were a mathematician. I said, that's right. And you're reading the New Testament. Yes, I said, that's right. And I went on reading knowing that his curiosity would soon get the better of him, which it did. <laughs> and he then said, excuse me, he said, I don't really want to interrupt you, but you're reading the New Testament, <laughs> and you're a mathematician. I said, yes. He said, why are you doing that? I said, let me ask you a question. What hope have you got? And there was dead silence, and he went white in the face. The man is midlife. 
He said, I guess we'll all just muddle through. I said, you know I didn't mean that. What hope have you personally got? He said, none whatsoever. I said, then you need to read this. So I gave him a copy. By the way, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? When did you last give someone a bit of it? Perhaps you don't believe it as much as you think. You see, Scripture, the Word of God, is the only offensive weapon we've got. Many of us say we believe it, but we don't actually. Because we let it stick with us. We listen to sermons. We let... We live as one-way streets. It's all pouring in and nothing's going out. So we nearly burst because we're not doing what Christ called us to do, and that is get involved in sharing it because we're afraid. And what are we afraid of? What if I can't answer their questions? Well, you won't be able to mostly. Just admit it and tell them so, and then they realize you're human. Do you know, it's marvelous when our friends who aren't Christians realize we're human and that we don't know the answers to everything. The most important thing that we can do is be honest. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, once your friends have asked a question, let me just be very practical. May I be very practical? I have a little rule which I break often because I'm Irish, but I try to keep it. When I meet somebody new, I keep asking them questions until they ask me one. Try it the next time. Ordinary questions about family and life and all this kind of thing. People love to be asked questions, but eventually they'll ask you one, and then you will get opportunities to make friends. Some of us are so keen to get rid of the message that that's what we do, and we get one shot, and that's it over forever. We need to make friends. So anyway, Daniel had this basic set of values. We're in a society that's losing, in Europe anyway, that's lost its moorings because we've no shared worldview anymore. And there's a relativism in ethics and morality that is undermining some utterly basic concepts, like the concept of the family and relationships and so on. It's going to take an awful lot of courage to get back into the situation where we can stand for the truths that are given to us by the God who made us and knows exactly how we should function to enjoy life at its fullest. So values are a big thing. Remember, by the way, these vessels are important because they reappear in the book of Daniel. Do you remember that? At Belshazzar's feast. Belshazzar got them out of the museum, put them on the table, forced his nobility to drink out of them, and at that moment, a hand wrote on the wall behind them, You are weighed in the balances and found wanting. It's God's evaluation of Belshazzar. And that night Belshazzar was slain. That's how serious those vessels are to be taken. Because they lost him the empire. And values have lost many a potentate. Their empire and their power. Because their values have got corrupted. And God sees it. And so there's a huge lesson here. Your values and my values matter. People expect certain behavior from Christians, and if we don't square up to it, then we're letting the side down. It's a big pressure, isn't it? We need all the help we can get and all the encouragement we get. So number two is values. Now number three, the education system. Three years, I suppose that's where Oxford and Cambridge got the three-year system from. I don't know. And they were to be taught the literature and the language of the Babylonians. It's most interesting. This is the high civil service of Babylonia. And they taught them literature. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what civil services and administrations in the world teach literature. But the point of it is that Those who were to run the empire had to know the literature and the culture. 
And Daniel got to know it, and it wasn't wasted time. If you love people, you'll have to read some of what they read. Do you know, Paul loved the Greeks in the ancient world that he read what they read. And so when he was put on the spot in Athens at the university, he knew how to, quote, correct insights from pagan authors. Could you do that? Isn't it interesting, you know? Some people say, oh, but he shouldn't do that. And I say, uh, was the car you drive designed by a Christian? Oh, it wasn't, was it? Was it made by a Christian? Oh, but you drive it. Well, what about ideas? Are all the ideas out there wrong? Now, we've got to be very careful here. But the point is, if you're going to build bridges, you've got to know what people are thinking. And that is my point in the questions. Constantly asking questions, as the Lord did, and as his disciples did, and as Michael and Ravi will be saying again and again and again, do come and listen to them. So, they were going to be educated and stand before the king. And they're now named, among these were Daniel and his friends. And their names are given. And then their new names are given. What's all that about? It's about social engineering. You see, well, you imagine it in the University of King's College Babylon, shall we call it. Daniel and his friends on the first evening, and they're sitting, all four of them, shyly in a corner, not knowing what to do. And a young Babylonian student comes up to them and says, hi, guys, my name's Nabu. Oh, nice to meet you. Mine's Daniel. It's what? I've never heard that name before. I mean, I'm Nabu. That's the moon god, and that's pretty clear. So, Daniel, what does your name mean? Well, it actually means God is my judge. God is your what? God is my judge. What language is that? It's Hebrew. Oh, oh well, sorry, guys. I, I did hear that Nebuchadnezzar had a little skirmish over there and beat your country up. Well, never mind. You'll soon forget that. You'll be fine here. But has your name got a, uh, this meaning of, uh, of your name, God is my judge? No wonder you got beaten up. Imagine imagine, and now I'm listening to Christopher Hitchens debating me at the Edinburgh Festival years ago. Your God's like a North Korean dictator in the sky, he said, always watching to see if you're enjoying anything and to spoil it and stop it. That is the idea that's around. God is my judge, and I can just watch the wheels going and say, Nabu, what course are you engaged in? Are, are you studying administration like Austin Law? Yes. Well, are you going to the lecture in Hammurabi tomorrow, a code of Hammurabi? Yes, I am. Oh, really? What are you hoping to do? Well, actually, I, I hope to be a lawyer myself. Oh, how interesting. And possibly even a judge. Oh, so you do believe in judgment. <laughs> what is the base of judgment, Nabu? Is it arbitrary? Do you know, I've studied ethics, and I'm very interested in it. And if you look at the legal profession, the medical profession, the business profession, you'll find one question people don't want to answer. Who said so? What is the authority behind your ethics? We're going to be asked that more and more. And you can see Daniel and Nabu having a great fight, and Daniel saying, look, if there's no absolute backup then, of course, in the end, ethical opinion is quite arbitrary. How are you going to decide? And then Hananiah comes along and says, look, Daniel, that's enough of your name. Let me tell them what my name means. Well, what does your name mean? The Lord shows grace. Oh, I see. You believe in the judge God, Daniel, and you believe in the grace God. No, says Mishael. There is only one God, Mishael. God is utterly unique. Who is like God is? And then in the end, I can imagine poor old Azariah coming in and saying, look, guys, my name means God has helped us. Why don't you watch us, Nabu, for the next few weeks? Because we believe this stuff is true, you know. It's real. 
And if you watch this, you'll see it's real. Their names, do you know, you could almost preach the gospel from them. I've done it many times. But they weren't going to be allowed to do it. The tall poppies, as the Australians say, had to be cut down. And they were given mock pagan names. Brilliant social engineering. Put them all in blue jeans. Make them intellectually, make them all look identical. No one must stand out, especially if they've got a descriptor that has anything to do with God. Stop it. Do you recognize that? We do in Europe. The European Constitution hasn't got the word God in it anywhere. In spite of the number of nations that wanted it in, by over a thousand years, two thousand years of Christian culture airbrushed out as if it never existed. You don't do God in public. This is an ancient version of that. Give them all pagan names so that the differences will not appear because you mustn't be different. You must all conform. This is what we are facing in the intellectual world and everywhere else in my country. It's exactly this. Do you know it's lovely? Daniel couldn't help them calling him names, pagan names. But you know, when the Babylonian Empire fell, he was called Daniel for the rest of the book. Ah, but there's a big story here, ladies and gentlemen. What culture changes names? Well, this wasn't Beijing, it wasn't New York, it wasn't London. This was Babylon. What's that got to do with anything? If I were to ask you, what did Babylon stand for? Well, you probably recall from Genesis the philosophy, the ideology that stood behind Babylon. Let us build a city and a tower that'll reach to the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. By the way, have you noticed the competition among the nations to build the highest building? There's a whole philosophy of skyscrapers. It's fascinating. And it boils down to this. Behind every tall building, there's an even bigger ego. <laughs> Reaching for the sky. It's almost comical, Genesis, isn't it? They thought it would reach to heaven. And Genesis says, and God came down to see their building. It didn't go high enough. But now this is the restless intellectual energy of building bigger, building up. And building up to give yourself what? It's to give yourself an identity. What is your name really? Well, mine's John. But who are you? What is your identity? And the Babylonian king was clever. He would change their identity because he was on a mission to build a name, that is to build an identity for himself. That's the context. But you see, Daniel's great ancestor came from that region originally. His name was Abram, subsequently Abraham. And in the next chapter of Genesis, God said to Abraham, come out and I will make your name great. As we sit here this morning, there are only two ways of living. We're either trying to make our name great by stepping over other people, by cutting corners, by pushing. And we're all sinners, so don't say that never affected any of us. Of course it does. We live in a society and much of the psychology behind it is push your way to the top and earn your significance that way. Make it yourself. Or... 
we're learning to trust God for our significance. I will make your name great. That's a battle for many of us, isn't it? We look at other people, they're more gifted, they're wealthier, they're more talented, they've got, got it all. So God made a mistake, did he? And this brings us back full circle, you see, in God's overarching sovereignty, which is not fatalism. You're you. And I reminded you that as a creature of God, you're of infinite value, but far beyond that, as a Christian, you have been redeemed, not with corruptible things, not with those kind of values such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood. You're of huge value as a saved person, as a redeemed person. Let that sink in, because some of us, perhaps many of us, these questions rise, what use am I? Little me, what value have I got really? Look at these others and so on and so forth. It's so important we come back to actually grip the gospel, the good news about God's evaluation. And Daniel understood it as much as he could in those pre-Christian days. And it was enormously important. Your identity, where is it to be found? For me to live is Christ, said Paul. All the other stuff I counted to be loss. I want to gain in my knowledge of him. I want to get to know him. I want to get to know the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection. That was it. But so far as the world goes, it's often all the perks, all the honors, all the degrees, but they don't add up to character any of those things, do they? What a tremendous thing it is to know that God says to me, let me take care of your name. Let me take care of your name. But there's a final thing, ladies and gentlemen. And that is that Daniel protested at the food. Well, students do, you know. <laughs> Bet you've done it yourself. But this was high-class food, gourmet dining at the king's table. And Daniel protested. And the dean of students wasn't happy because he liked Daniel. And Daniel had obviously befriended him and he said, look to Daniel, this is extreme honesty. I fear my Lord the King who has signed your food and your drink, for why should he say that you were in worse condition than the user of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the King. What's this about? Not history, not values, not identity, but image. Is that important to you? Did you look in the mirror this morning? Did you like what you saw? Image. We spend billions on advertising agencies and on image providers. Why should the king see you looking worse? And the poor man was terrified. So Daniel suggested the first randomized control trial in history in epidemiology. Well, it wasn't quite randomized. Test us for... 10 days, and judge by what you see. Image. Forgive a personal story, ladies and gentlemen, but it belongs to why I'm sitting here. I was 19. I was sitting at dinner in Cambridge in one of our special dinners in my college and found myself beside a Nobel Prize winner for the first time in my life. So I tried to talk to him as usual, playing Socrates, which I've done for a long time, and asking him questions and gradually approaching the God question. And as I approached, he retreated. He didn't like it at all. So I backed off, which you must always do. Always give people space. You never get anywhere if you don't. 
And I thought that was the end of it. And after the meal, he came over to me and he said, Lennox, come to my room. And it was a command. It wasn't an invitation. So I went to his room and discovered that he'd invited two or three other senior people, no students, and he put me on a chair and they stood around me. And he said to me, Lennox, do you want a career in science? I said, yes, sir. All right, he said, tonight in front of witnesses, give up these naive beliefs in God. They'll cripple you. You'll never make it. You will suffer by comparison with your peers. I'd never known pressure like that. And of course, I thought if he had been a Christian and I'd been an atheist, and he'd tried to browbeat me into Christianity, he'd probably have lost his post in the university the next day. So I looked at him, and I remember I didn't know, really know what to do, and I, I said, sir, what would you offer me that's better than what I've already got? So he mentioned some prim... <laughs> he mentioned a very primitive form of Bergsonian evolution, which I hope most of you have never heard of. But I had, because I read C.S. Lewis, I knew what it was. And I said, sir, if that's all you've got, I'll take the risk. I'll stick with what I've got. And I got up and walked out. But that, <laughs> that put steel into my heart. And it stayed there. Sooner or later, it may not be in that way, but we are going to be called out And there's no experience that can transform your life more than seeing someone who doesn't share your worldview come to bow at the foot of the cross and trust Christ. And when that happens, it changes everything. Because you see, I grew up, there were loads of Christians around in Northern Ireland. And my unspoken question was this, is it really possible to change your worldview and become a Christian? And until I saw it actually happen with my own eyes, I was uncertain. And the reason I'm sitting here is this, because I've seen it happen not once, but many, many times. Now, there are many things I'd love to share with you, but I'm sure they're shared with you by your pastors and teachers far better than I could. But if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I don't want you to look back in 30 years and say, you know, I listened to that stuff and it seemed to me to ring true that day. And somehow I just walked away. Don't walk away. Talk to somebody. You're bound to know Christians. Grill them. Get to know. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is the big stuff of life. Think about it. If Christianity is true, Jesus Christ, the Word, invented the human brain. That's a bit higher level than the Nobel Prize. He created the universe and the stars, and he made human life, and he created you in his image. He offers you his companionship, but he won't force it on you. Because he's interested in you responding in love, not under pressure. And so God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just imagine what perishing means. You can walk away from it if you wish. 
because he loves you so much, he won't force his way into your life. But if you open your heart, he'll run to greet you. May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much.